Hey, Stephen Young here doing the Junkyard Crawl at Bernardston Auto Wrecking in Bernardston, Massachusetts with a 1958 Mercedes-Benz 180. These are often called the pontoon family because of the way the rear fender line here kind of sticks out like a pontoon. But don't confuse this with an old school 40s or early 50s American potato with bolt-on fenders. This is all integrally stamped and that look is purely cosmetic. Now these are very advanced cars. This is the W180 family. This one happens to be a 180, but these were built between 1954 and 1959. And this is one of Mercedes' first unitized construction cars. Before 1954, Mercedes was largely body on frame. And the big thing about the pontoon is the, again, unit construction, the inner fenders are welded to the firewall and it's a subframe. And Mercedes actually patented the crumple zones which basically front and rear would protect the occupant compartment from harm receiving the impact. We see this one definitely did its job at some point. This one's crunched right here. And again, Mercedes-Benz, you see the, the great Mercedes grill here. And for the first time, the uh, W180 family, the grill was actually canted back somewhat on an angle for the first time. Previous to this, it was generally vertical. But we see right here, the Mercedes TriStar. And here, this is a fake radiator cap. Doesn't do a darn thing. And this would have had the TriPoint star right here on top. People always snatch those things. Now, if you ever wondered, Mercedes-Benz, what does that mean? Well, Carl Benz was the fellow who was the mechanical guy, but the funder behind this thing was Emil Jelinek. Well, he had a daughter named Mercedes Jelinek. Mercedes? Benz, Jelnick, and Carl Benz. That's the name of Mercedes Benz right there. Now, of course, Mercedes Benz still very much alive and well, but under the hood of this one here, we'll see nothing. Yeah, the engine is gone, but again, this would have had a 1.8 liter four cylinder engine, and we can sort of see rep remains of the firewall. This one has been sliced and diced. I think we'll find out why in a minute, but an electric wiper, no vacuum here, good stuff. And in the center of the hood here, that little thing sticking down, we look at the other side of the hood, and that was the windshield squirter, left and right. That would have a little pressurized uh, stream for the wipers. Now, this car was last registered in 1984, and we can see that uh, it uh, was not a bad car. It does seem to be pretty much rust-free. Here are the headlight rings here. These would have been on the ends of the fenders. These are probably pretty rare unto themselves, and these are made of stainless steel which is a good thing. Again, stainless doesn't really deteriorate too much over time. Um, we go to the back, and it is a four-door. These are available as two doors, four doors, even a little wagon. There was even a roadster. And believe it or not, the Mercedes-Benz 190 SL, the baby brother of the 300 SL, was based on the pontoon right here. Uh, inside, this again is a four-door. And this odd side beam that we see right here is not Mercedes-Benz. Again, this was somebody's going to be hot rod. This is all welded in, and maybe somebody was either moving this or was going to do some kind of a, a really crude square frame inside. Not sure. Put it on a Jeep chassis. Who knows what was in the works for this thing. It never did get to fruition, but we can still see the interior panels. Kind of classy. Uh, some fabric and vinyl, maybe some leather going on. And uh, again, as a four-door, this one is a very rigid car. It's a sedan. You can see right here the fixed B-pillar right there, very rigid stuff. And dig this, man. The, the door hinges, the latch is right here, designed to not open up in a crash. These are very uh, solid parts. We can see where definitely these are not meant to uh, open up in a crash. Made by Bomoro, B-O-M-O-R-O, -O, which was undoubtedly a German subcontractor that made latches and door assemblies for Mercedes and probably other companies. Let's see if the window works. And yeah, it still does. Look at that. Mercedes quality right there. The window winders still function as intended from back in the day. Getting around to the back again. Here is that pontoon. The effect sort of like a pontoon added on. But again, it's integral to the car. One piece quarter panel. And previous to the 1954 W180, Mercedes did have bolt-on fenders. So this was definitely a step toward the envelope construction that Detroit and the entire auto stream was embracing. This right here is the lower rocker panel that would appear underneath the doors. And we can see right here, you open the doors, there's a rubber step. You can wipe your feet off. But again, this white rubber right here, which probably was black at one point, just bleached out with the sun. But we can see here on the front and at the back, these little cutouts. These are where the jack would go through 
to lift the car to change a tire. So these are the original rockers, and these are actually in very nice condition. Well, you know, they're not too bad, a little bit of crunch on the back, but technically somebody with a restoration project might want these. There's one for each side of the car. So again, the little rocker panels, but again, unit construction, not body on frame. And here's one of the original hubcaps with the Mercedes TriStar. But again, one of the problems of 1950s was stainless steel, uh, at least in this country, was a strategic material during the Korean conflict. It wasn't a war, folks. Uh, so this, like Mercedes, used a steel hubcap with a chrome plating. The only problem with this stuff is that it peels off. You know, now, of course, Mercedes was not involved in the Korean, but there's the copper underplate. See that sort of coppery color right there? That's how you do chrome plating. You copper plate it first, and then you chrome plate it, at least if you're doing it right. And Mercedes did, but even chrome plating as good as this is, definitely Mother Nature will begin to digest it, as we see here. But those are the hubcaps that once served on this car. Nice little streamlined touch right here. The fuel filler, not in a, a proud knob, but rather a hidden device here with cast aluminum. Look at this, the cast aluminum cap. Mercedes was big on cast aluminum. I like the joke, this is once a, a Messerschmitt 109 after World War II, they melted down all the um, war machines and turned them into things like this. But again, these had uh, aluminum cam covers on the 1.8 liter four banger, a big cast aluminum thing. In fact, aluminum was big on Mercedes cars. And the tail of this one, we can see the 180, which tells us this once had the 1.8 liter four banger. There's also a one, uh, 90, there was a 220, so a variety of different engines, but again, 1.8 liters is what the 180 is all about here. And it's kind of cool, little tail lights are still in place. These are plastic, Mercedes had moved from glass to plastic, but the little reflectors here, standalone, kind of a cool little deal, pretty rugged reflectors there, perhaps for the United States market, not sure. And in the trunk, what do we have? Okay, yeah, signs of the original shiny black right here in effect. And again, the underside of the trunk is always the most protected area on any car, but we'll get this out of the way. <laughs> we can see right here, once again, unitized construction. The trunk walls are part of the inner structure, the floor to make the tub very stiff, the inside of the car. And again, this is a crumple zone back here. And Mercedes-Benz, I think 1952, patented crash and crumple zones on, on passenger cars. And here they are in effect here. Now this here is something kind of neat. I collect all kinds of literature, as we all know. This is an SAE journal, the Society of Automotive Engineers, the SAE. This one was originally sent to the library of the engineer division of Boeing aircraft in Seattle back in May of 57, copy number four. They got a handful of these things, but inside this, the beauty of these things, the SA journals, is these are an insider's guide. This is not Hot Rod or Motor Trend. These are actually insider publications for people in the auto and aircraft industries, and they're kind of cool. But in here, big news for 1957 shows right here the merger on the left hand side. It shows the, uh, the Daimler crest. And of course, our Curtis Wright crest at the bottom or in the middle, and then of course, Studebaker Packard at the bottom. Yep, the three of these things merge. Now sales, we can see Studebaker Packard, $303 um, million. Dollars, and of course, uh, Curtis Wright, 571 million, the strongest of the bunch, and of course, Mercedes or Daimler, 392. And on the right hand side, the merger of the three, and it says here, these three companies, Daimler Benz, Curtis Wright, Studebaker Packard, employing 107,000 people with sales, oop, love the wind, with sales in 1956 totaling $1,266 million, announced the signing of agreements providing for fully integrated program of engineering, production, sales, and service of automotive vehicles. And it says here, Studebaker Packard Corporation, in signing the agreements, will now make available to its dealers a full line of domestic and imported sports cars, convertibles, sedans, and station wagons, ranging in price from under $2,000 up to $13,000. Mercedes-Benz cars and distinctive Mercedes-Benz features such as the fine coachwork swing axles and transmissions will be exclusive to Studebaker Packard. Here it is right here. Now this merger only lasted 57 through 63, but Daimler merged with Chrysler in 1998 through 2007, the infamous merger of equals that brought us rear wheel drive. But again, here we have it, Studebaker and Packard. If you wanted a Mercedes Benz, you went to a Studebaker or a Packard dealer. Now the thing is in 1963, when Studebaker decided to stop building cars, what happened? Well, Mercedes bought itself out of that deal. And that was the beginning of Mercedes of America, which has grown from strength to strength sense. And it's kind of fun to play model cars. And this is actually a vintage model kit, which looks like a pontoon Mercedes. This is from ITC, which is the hobby division of Ideal Toy Corporation. If you're a, a, you know, all kinds of toys are made by Ideal, 
But this is our model division and the suit we have inside the box. And it's kind of cool little illustration. Looks like a pontoon and it's a little four door, kind of like the car we're looking at here. And it says motorized. Let's find out what we're looking at with this one here. And the kit itself, got to say, it's not a pontoon. This is a pre-pontoon car with the exaggerated front fender. This is like a 51 or two. But with that said, it's a little Mercedes coupe hardtop. Not a very realistic looking thing, but kind of a cool thing. But it has electric motor. You can actually take this thing and run it and drive it with a little electric motor. The wheels are kind of more toy than a model kit. The tires are kind of goofy. But again, kind of a neat Mercedes Benz and almost anything, you name it, there's been a model kit made of it, including the quasi pontoon Mercedes. This thing's from 1958, this kit right here. So kind of cool. Nobody built it. Maybe I will. Who can say? But here's the deal. The price on this thing new was a total of $3,240, which is $1,000 more than a Ford Fairlane. And only $250 more would have bought you a 58 Corvette. So people who bought Mercedes Benz then and now pay a little more for a perceived extra quality. And in this case, it was a more quality car. But with something like 58 horsepower coming out of that 1.8 liter Ford banger. This was not going to compete in the Detroit horsepower races of the 1950s. But with that said, these were very popular cars all over the globe. And these were built in many countries, not just Germany. And these were huge with taxi companies. And keep in mind, the 190 SL, the little roadster and coupe that makes all that money at Barrett Jackson and other auctions, the bones are one of these things right here, right down to the swing axle in the back, 13 inch wheels, aluminum drums. But with that said, these were incredibly popular cars, mostly seen as taxi cabs and family cars throughout the globe. And again, this is the entry level Mercedes right here, the top of the pile being the 300 SL in 1958. But that's the story of the Mercedes pontoon, the W180 family, Mercedes first mass produced unit construction car in the post-war era. And again, $3,240 would have bought this. What would you have bought, this or a Ford Fairlane and saved a thousand bucks. That's your decision. But if you like this video, be sure to tell your friends, give us a like, and uh, ring the bell so that you're aware of the next video, which happens tomorrow morning.